Hello, I'd like to welcome you all to the webinar on participatory on-farm research presented by SIGSNAP of Michigan State University. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the Organic Agriculture Community of Practice with eExtension. We're a community of cooperative extension service personnel, researchers, ag professionals, organic certifiers, and practitioners. You can find all our published articles, videos, and recorded webinars on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce our speaker. Sig Snap is a professor of soils and crop sciences and actually cropping system ecology at Michigan State University. She's been privileged to work with farmers to develop innovative extension and research models for the last two decades. I am really excited to spend a little time with you today to talk about participatory on-farm research. So one of the things I'm sure you're thinking about is, what is on-farm research? Well, farmers have been engaged in observations and conducting different types of research and experimental manipulations for thousands of years. And we're particularly going to talk today about participatory types of on-farm research. So I'm going to give you a project, and that is to think about what sort of objective do you have in your on-farm research? So if you're already engaged in participatory on-farm research, you know that this can be a frustrating but really fun and exciting way to learn about new knowledge and to fine-tune different types of technologies or varieties. And generally, we are looking at systematic comparisons of different management systems. And with new tools that farmers have, such as different types of uh, GPS, we can georeference different types of information, like yields or soil samples, and learn a bit more about how our different ways of management have influenced these. But ultimately, we are about trying to ensure relevance, whether it's an experiment you do on your own farm, or whether it's a large group of researchers, extension educators, producers working together. We're all about trying to be relevant and make sure that the different technologies and the knowledge we develop is practical. We're also engaged in a co-learning project. That is that we're all about being lifelong learners, so how can we make sure that we systematically incorporate different evaluations and traits, what we learn as we go, so that we, the next cycle we integrate what we learned before. And I'll be talking about some of the tools and approaches available for that. Finally, I'm going to talk a bit about quantifying G by E. So you might wonder what G by E is, unless you're a plant breeder. Plant breeders have been working on genetics by environment and trying to understand that interaction for a long time. You can also think of it as varieties or trialing varieties or looking at different technologies, such as different types of tillage and how they perform in different environments. And by environments, we mean not just uh, the biophysical climate, for example, which obviously varies from farm to farm, but also we're thinking about the socioeconomic, the market context. So this is a really big question. How does technologies perform in different environments? And again, there's some specific statistical approaches that we've been learning that you can use to try and quantify this interaction. So, so as I said, your goal is to think about what objectives you are, uh, is your focus in your participatory research. Because objectives matter. And so there's something that's been developed called the researcher-farmer continuum. Here, articulated by Gonzalo Halves, but uh, Chambers and others have developed this for many years. And it goes from researcher-managed types of on-farm trials to farmer-managed. In between, we have consultative and collaborative. So collaborations where they have farmers, researchers, extension educators, perhaps different stakeholders, such as uh, equipment dealers, conservationists. Many different people can be at the table working in a collaborative mode. Now, I'm putting out this continuum not to say that you should all be more participatory than thou. One should, should always be at this end. No, it's just to point out that depending on your objectives, you might want to be 
developing a more researcher-led effort that includes some consultation, or more farmer-led effort. It just depends on the objectives of the project. So let's take the first objective, ensuring relevance. Now, researchers are at a little bit of a disadvantage here. And I say that because, not just tongue-in-cheek, but because we often have access to researcher stations. So the research station, or experiment station, is a great opportunity. We have field equipment, and we can do little plot experiments like this shown here. But the challenge is that there is a legacy or history of those plots. And 20 years ago, someone may have done a phosphorus experiment with different rates or perhaps different varieties, and that has impact today. And so the soils become less uniform and may not be a good, relevant uh, platform for doing the types of experiments that you might want to do. So you have to think about that. There's legacies. And the other thing is that we have to engage with the real world if we're going to be relevant to the real world. So the complexity that is out on farmer's fields may be something that we want to get involved in. So here's just an example from my work in southern Africa. And it's somewhat of an extreme example, but I've seen it in other parts of the world in that here we have an average carbon or organic matter uh, from hundreds of on-farm uh, fields, farmer's fields, near the experiment station. So these are three locations in Malawi. And at this southern site, the organic matter on the research station is about double what it is on farmer's fields. And it's even more so in northern Malawi. So this is an issue. Some sort of uh, experiment that you're conducting, such as different types of conservation tillage, might work well at high organic matter, but it not, might not be under the real world situation. So this is a good example of uh, non-relevant or very different experiment station soil types than on farm. And this often happens when on a research station, you can perhaps do a long, complex rotation with pastures and keep organic matter up. But in the tropics, these on-farm sites are quite different. Now, OK, so maybe I've convinced you the reasons to go on-farm. But how can we do that? When we see this site in Southern California with many different farm and fields here, it's really complex. So where do we start? Well, there are. It can be, a, you can choose different gradients, perhaps a chrono sequence, which just means you find farmers that have been doing a different practice for a different amounts of time. So for example, organic farmers that have been can, carrying out organic management practices for 20 years, 10 years, and two years. Then you have a chrono sequence of different times and a gradient of organic management. So you can look at effects of how long organic um, practices how long before they start changing the soils and changing other properties of the system. And another classic approach is to look at case studies. So take each farm as a case study. Now this has a challenge in terms of inference, like how much can you extrapolate beyond one case study. Paired farms is another approach that has been widely used, and that is to find farms that are very similar except for a management difference or uh, different use of varieties. Groups of farms are also often used a cluster um, to carry out on-farm experiments. So here's an example from John Reganall from Washington State University where in a video he has on his website there, you can see how he talks about how he spent a lot of time developing paired on-farm sites. So he had organic managed strawberries and conventionally managed strawberries. But he paid attention to the soil types to make sure they were matched well across the, the fields and that they were located near each other. And then in the end, he could make inferences about differences between the uh, fruit quality and many other properties of the soils and the plants between these two management systems because he had originally set up paired sites. Sometimes these are called across the French row comparisons. So you have two, exper uh, two different management systems, such as no-till and ridge-till. And then across the French uh, fence row, you can compare how these affected the soil over time. They're sort of a form of natural experiment. 
there's a number of ways to use different statistical analysis to analyze what you're finding. Now, a t-test is a really simple way. If you have paired farms already set up, then you can compare variables from the paired farms, like a yield comparison, for example, between the organic and conventionally managed strawberry fields, for example. Now, in the real world, we often have a lot more complex issues than that. And what I really want, one of the take-homes today from this talk, is that we can embrace that complexity. And that there are statistical approaches that we can use where we don't have to find the perfect natural experiment or paired field. We can actually embrace the complexity that's there. Because often, a particular type of management might occur more on one uh, area in a landscape. So it's hard to find paired comparisons, for example, of types of conservation tillage that are adopted more in steep slopes, for example. So using structural equation modeling to develop and test our research questions, so from the beginning, or using multivariate data analysis where we collect a large uh, range of data then we, and look at the interrelationships and the variation of that data, then we can embrace that complexity and develop composite hypotheses about the cause and effect relationships among the variables. And I'm going to give some resources at the end if you want to pursue these a bit further. You'll find that you can use expert farmers, literature review, researchers to help develop these cause-effect relationships. So in other words, you're building hypotheses at the start. Multivariate approaches a range, including what's widely historically been used, weighted averages. But principal component analysis is one that has been recently used in on-farm experiments to some great advantage. I'll give an example of that. But any type of multivariate, you need to collect a lot of data. And it's really uh, useful if you can georeference that data. In other words, using a geopositioning satellite system such as shown here to, when you're sampling, make sure that you georeference where you took those samples. Because one of the challenges we face in on-farm experiments is that you look across your field and you can either set use strips to try and capture all that variability, very carefully position some different experimental manipulations or varieties you're testing, you're trialing, or you can actually look at the whole field and using something like a GPS be able to get yield data because many combines and harvesting equipment will actually have GPS units these days. Or when you're soil sampling, get another layer of data that you can relate to that yield through system like shown here, Edgar Poe. So in this work he reported in Soil Science Society of America Journal, he looked at actual versus predicted potato yields. So the harvester had a GPS on it, so he had actual yields in different locations in the field. But he also had soil properties and some infrared reflectance properties from different parts of the field. And so he had predicted yield. And so he could see the relationship. Could he explain that variability? So instead of trying to overwhelm the variability with fertilizers or using a, some sort of statistical approach to take out the variation, he was looking here at could he predict the yield and how much did characteristics of the soil help predict the yield? And it turned out in this particular study that, that chemistry uh, from chemical fertilizer or soil chemical properties did not have much influence at all on predicting yield. But, and not surprisingly, because farmers were using different fertilizers to maximize chemical um, nutrients. But physical properties were really important. So we learned that out of that study. Now here's one of the uh, pioneering study by Laurie Drinkwater and colleagues in 1995 on farm in tomato fields in California. And the main point I want to show here is that, as you might expect, there was a lot of variation in any property that they looked at in terms of the soil. And these are conventional from conventional fields, and their variation is very high, as you'd expect. There was quite a lot of conventional farms, and they were located on almost every soil type. Organic farms, on the other hand, were not located on as wide a range of soils. But what was really interesting is this other principal component, so it's an, 
component of the uh, explaining some of the variability was due to management. So in this case, looking at a range of variables, including soil and plant variables, the organic systems of tomato production separated out quite strongly from the conventional. So just to recap in terms of relevance, understanding on-farm variation is really at the core, rather than trying to control variables. Because if you want to control variables, maybe you should go to a greenhouse type experiment or a small pot experiment. So instead embrace that variation. And at the beginning, the experimental sites that you choose are really critical. Whether it's a particular field on your farm to do an experiment, or if it's a large project, multiple states, you want to choose representative sites. And sometimes it's convenient to use a site that maybe with a farmer that you worked with before, or perhaps use a field that's near your uh, house that would be convenient. But I really uh, emphasize the importance of going beyond convenience, developing experimental sites that, and farms that represent what in the end you want to be relevant to, which makes sense. Your inference depends very much on the original sites being representative of that area. And think about using a gradient or perhaps paired sites. Some of the tools that we're using these days include georeferencing your information into a geographic information system and using multivariate analytical approaches. So take two. Let's think about other objectives. On-farm research analytical approaches will help us understand some of the biological responses in the field. But this is actually an engaged learning project. This is about participatory research and learning together. So we need to pay attention to outcomes, not just improved technologies, but iterative co-learning and capacity building. And the project design needs to put explicit attention and time into this. And in the end of the day, I have seen this end up having more impact because innovation, farmers' uh, ability to fine tune and improve the technology, and researchers' ability to learn what about their technologies don't make sense and start over the drawing board if needed or fine tune their technologies. This is all part of a co-learning project. So this can be expressed this way. If we're going to en engage in this type of participatory research for impact, then we start with some sort of diagnosis or systems analysis. What is wrong in your farm or what is wrong in multi-state project like some of the new recent climate change um, projects? How can we do help uh, farming systems become more adaptive and to mitigate climate change? Big picture. So you have many uh, researchers, extension educators, private industry, and farmers at the table. And looking at literature review, expert farmers to come up with your systems analysis. Then you come up with some sort of best bets or research questions. What are the options that might improve the situation? What is the technology you want to test? Design on-farm research together and involve farmers in the uh, interpretation and evaluation of those technologies. Then we have iterative co-learning. And then one of the most exciting parts about this is then to refine those best bet options to better bets or some people call them plausible options, things that make sense and then keep refining them. And we need to pay attention to how farmer capacity is built, and I would say also researcher capacity to understand the system, and what sort of better bets are coming out of this. This is sometimes called a learning cycle. So the first part is identifying the question or options, then co-designing an experiment, Developing an evaluation criteria, both farmer and researcher evaluation. Statistical analysis to be able to synthesize beyond one particular or one small set of on-farm sites and see what are the larger questions, what is the systems telling us in terms of how it performs at different environments. Also conducting education, refining the options, and if necessary, going back to the drawing board, starting to look at a totally different type. For example, an experiment um, that I just showed you that had um, and best bets. We had cover crop best bets. And now we're moving on to different types of perennial grains, because we're finding that cover crops don't do all the things that we need to do it. So we're trying 
uh, a wider range of options, including perennials. So a few hints about this type of learning cycle. It is really important to do the homework, to review the state of the knowledge, and including in the literature, to agree on a shared agenda. Uh, I've done things like we get a facilitator in to help see researchers may be looking for partners and have particular expertise they bring to the table, like in my case, soil fertility and cropping system combinations. But farmers may have a wide range of objectives. Maybe they're more interested in combinations of compost and manure and not so interested in some sort of integrated nutrient management that I've been looking at. So you look at where there's overlap, overlapping objectives so that you can have a shared agenda. Then developing researcher questions, research questions and options to test. And I want to emphasize here that it's not that everyone has to be involved at every step. This takes a tremendous amount of time. But that you might have some farmers involved at, as expert farmers that have the time. Um, we certainly have all had known farmers that are retired or are really committed that are really seen as experts in their community of breeding, for example, developing new options. And this is where a lot of this comes out of is the participatory plant breeding. But I think it has a lot of lessons for those working in systems design or soil fertility management. So some expert farmers might be at the table every single meeting. Other farmers want to be involved, but they really have stressed to me in many different venues that they need to have a really simple option to test. And so they might be doing more trialing varieties or involved in another different level of engagement. And same with researchers. Maybe your statistician is there and just to a certain extent, or an extension educator is involved um, in terms of certain aspects of the trial. So you have to think about who can participate at what levels and what are their agenda, what are they getting out of it. And you need to take the time. This is a project that takes time. And as I said, a facilitator can help with some brainstorming sessions so you can keep your communication clear. And building in time for reflection. Once a year having a planning meeting, we reflect over what you learned last year and what's coming up, I think is just essential. So choosing appropriate on-farm design, and a lot of on-farm experiments that I've seen over the years are actually a research experiment station trial that's just been taken on-farm. And I think that kind of misses the point. And a lot of times it really means that it's harder for uh, farmers to engage with it because it's really complex, and it really is more renting farm uh, land from farmers. So in many times, if you're really trying to engage farmers in their uh, assessment of things, or support farmers doing their own experiments, I think it's important we not just try and duplicate a research or trial. And I'm going to give some experimental designs that can facilitate a range of, of complexity and a range of intensity. So communication, as we know, is key. Uh, many researchers talk about how the frustration of working on farm and then finding that their experiment uh, that, that was basically irrigation occurred at the wrong time, or maybe the crop was harvested before they got there. So communication both directions is really essential. So what sort um, of I just wanted to, you said you were interested in making this participatory, so I wanted oh, to um, just um, have, there are a couple questions that are coming in. Um, one of them is, when using multiple on-farm sites, how important are replications at each site? Oh, that's a really good question about replication. And that's one I want to give some different options at the next, uh, in the last section of this, about uh, different ways to replicate. But I just want to emphasize that, again, it relates to your objectives, and that sometimes we replicate across space. So in other words, if you have 20 farms involved, they each might have one replicate. Um, sometimes it's important to, if you just have a one area that you're doing it, to replicate within that site. And if you're using multiple sites and each farm is just one replicate, then I think it's important to have more than, to have usually about 10 replicates. But if we're just doing one site, then you can often just have about four replicates. So I'll get to that in a minute, but that's a good question. Okay, that's great. And just one other question, which was going back to um, your first part of your presentation. What does the infrared reflection yield tool do? Okay, there is a number of ways that people are using uh, different types of spectrophotometry, so that's a little beyond, you know, this particular talk, but things like um, the green seekers is, is a form of that. Using You can actually use photography as a way to 
um, look at reflectance, um, both soil and plant um, indicators. So there's a range of tools these days that are related to yield. And I'll, I'll be happy to send uh, my contact information. My email will be at the end, and I will send that, that paper in particular. OK? OK. Thank you. All right. So great. Appreciate the talk, uh, questions, and I think it makes it more interesting <laughs> if we, <laughs> I get on a roll here. Um, so in terms of analytical approaches for this aspect of looking at engagement and building capacity, I want to emphasize that we can look at adoption studies, income impact assessment, where we also try and think of ways to assess capacity or how what we've learned out of it more than just how uh, better options or management options or varieties coming out or technology improvement, but also people's understanding and capacity. And finally, I want to touch on a little bit of systems analysis because a lot of times in on-farm research we're comparing systems and it's a little hard to compare apples and oranges. We use economics sometimes, which I'm not going to talk about today, but that is one way to do it, but I'm going to talk about a few other tools beyond economics. Apologies to my economist friend. Okay, but you can go beyond economics. So in projects, participatory projects, I want to point out that we need to make sure we have opportunities for learning, uh, whether it's ranking of carrots here or conducting an on-farm cover crop experiment or access to equipment to try it out. And at the end, I have some reference and some information about uh, there's on-farm experimentation for uh, funding for farmers from SARE and other resources on how to do on-farm trials and support for trying out different types of equipment. So I think paying attention to having these opportunities is really important. Because in engaged learning, improving farmer capacity, improving researcher capacity is part of the project. And we need to document farmer assessment as we go along, as well as conduct, think about whole systems comparisons. Instead of trying to optimize the system, look and learn about trade-offs and then publish those and share and disseminate those trade-offs. So sometimes our projects seem to involve mostly saying how this system, this can conservation tillage is better than all the others, but I think it's more important that we get to trade-offs. Here is one way, it's called a radar chart, and in it we have different axes, so we can look at, in this case, five different uh, properties of a system at once. So we have biomass being produced, we have protein yield and maize yield. So particularly when you're comparing maize or corn with a legume like soybean or cowpea, uh, the soybean or cowpea tend to be lower yielding, so when we just look at yield, then it's really not a fair comparison. Back to the apples versus oranges issue. But in terms of protein yield, then often they are very similar, and they can be very productive, a legume can, even though the overall yield isn't as high. The protein yield is very high, or even slightly higher as here. So in each of these axes of the radar chart, sometimes called a spider web chart for obvious reasons, uh, we have used the maximum that is produced, in this case, 500 um, grams per hectare, or in this case, 5,000 kilograms per hectare for yield. So we put this, this is the maximum, and then each of the treatments, you can see how it um, relates compared to that maximum. And you can see that without nitrogen fertilizer, this system is very unproductive, but there's some slight trade-offs in terms of if you compare a rotation, maize cowpea versus continuous maize, both in the conservation tillage tide ridge. So radar charts is basically an up-and-coming tool to show different types of trade-offs. I have nitrogen fertilizer efficiency and rain use efficiency, so I'm not going to go into all the details of different types of things you can put on the axes, but you can imagine some of your own, maybe cover, maybe soil organic matter, there's maybe the profitability. There's, it's just a way to look at, oh, this is more profitable. Um, uh, with this market, but maize yield is higher here in case you want to, um, for food security or such. Another one economist Scott Swinton just came up with, and this is to look at ratings from farmers, where again we look at trade-offs, and this acknowledges the fact that something might be really important to a farmer, like building soil organic matter, but something like reducing or mitigating global warming might be perceived by farmers in this survey as more important to society. So still important, but more to society. 
So there's ways to compare different uh, properties of a system. And I think it's good to keep exploring these so that we can do more than just look at yields, or sometimes we end up looking at profitability, but that can vary from year to year. Now, one of the ultimate ways to try and understand a system is, is it adopted or not? If it's adopted, clearly it has value to a number of people. And it is a way in society that we can see the progress we're making. And it was great in 2005, we started seeing USDA started tracking adoption of organic cropland, for example. So as we, we can start to see in different areas in the U.S. where here pasture and rangeland, not surprising, is bigger in uh, Texas than it is in Michigan. Um, if we had this for cover crops, conservation tillage, it would be really exciting too. If we have ways to measure adoption, then I'm not saying that this is a participatory on-farm project. I'm just saying that this shows adoption across the U.S. So at different scales, we can try to measure adoption, and that's one of the ultimate tests of impact of uh, participatory action research is whether we see technologies adopted or not. Okay, if there's no questions on that part, and we can come back to it at the end, I'm going to talk about a very specific issue called genetics by environment. This is where participatory plant breeders have really gone quite far ahead. In certain parts of the world, particularly in the southern hemisphere, but more recently, particularly amongst organic growers, breeders started to notice that they weren't reaching their objectives. Farmers were not taking up some of their varieties. And so they started to try and say, well, what is performance? Maybe some of our varieties of beans or corn, for example, are not doing well on farmers, particularly resource farmers, poor farmers in the Global South. Maybe they were doing well, but only in high fertility sites, and farmers couldn't afford that. So they started to look at, what's the interaction? Is there an environment where these varieties or technologies do well, and where do these varieties not do well? And this is called G by E. So I also want to stress here that environment is not just the biological and physical. It's not just the weather at that particular site. It's also the socioeconomic context. So farmers that have one market, say a local market, may have different properties they value in a variety, while farmers that are selling to different other markets, wholesale markets or uh, perhaps regional markets, would might is another socioeconomic context. So by environment, we mean the whole farm. So that's is why this is participatory action or on-farm research is that we're interested in how genetics or technologies perform at, at different environments, both the social environment and the biological. So we have to think about spatial analysis because what is the environment? We have to think about what are the boundaries on that environment? What are we trying to represent? And there are some different, different types of trial designs. We heard earlier the question about replication. That's always one of the issues is should we basically replicate an experiment station? on a farmer's field? And as I said earlier, no, I don't think so. I think we should be looking at different trial designs for different objectives. And there's some non-parametric methods, which I'm not going to go into today, but I'll give some resources on, because uh, many of our response variables, our yield and such, are not normally distributed when we work on farm. And so we have to often use non-parametric methods, particularly for farmers' rankings and so on. So I will just want to put that out there as one of the useful approaches. So when we're thinking and setting up an on-farm experiment, particularly with large fields, uh, we should be thinking about what are different zones in that field. Now, if we have a lot of topography, and you have both summit positions, slope positions, and depressions or near a stream here, then very clearly it would be useful if we want to know how technology performs in addition, in this case, we may want some replication at different slope positions. If we have a field that has a low soil fertility or a sandy area that has a high fertility area, we might also want to represent both. So in this case, even though it's on farm, and I'm going to argue for really simple on farm experiments, we still might want to replicate three times because we want to make sure we represent different locations in the field because we know the field uh, is quite has very different soils in those different topographical positions. And also it might be our objective to look at topography and how it influences the technology. So that can be one approach. Sasha Kravchenko 
uh, statistician here at Michigan State leading that. And another approach is what has been called the mother and daughter child design or the mother and baby child design. And originally, by the way, I named this the central satellite child design, which I thought was much more sophisticated. But a farmer in my southern Africa work uh, called it the mother trial. And that's this trial that has all the replicates and all the treatments, very complex. Might be at a research station, might be at a central location. And then the farmer said, but these are our daughter or baby trials that we all have. So that seemed to resonate more. Some people don't like the term, but it does is very evocative in the sense that we know that the mother trial probably has everything, and the baby trials are a subset. And that's the main point here, is that you don't try and test everything on every farm. Farmers can either choose maybe three varieties they want to look at in their four plots, so they have their own check variety, and then which they get to choose. So it's a way of getting collaboration in that the researchers may design this one, but the farmers get very involved. And they, in some cases, people have gone on and started grandchildren, basically uh, documenting and following farmer innovations. So you might have varieties here being tested, say three of them at this farm, three at another farm, another set of three here. And as I said, I recommend for these baby trials that we have at least 10 of them, because some may get washed out or something might happen to some of them. So it's important to have many of them. And then having all of the varieties together at one place where they can all be observed at once with several replications. Then looking at, over time, how farmers further innovate. For example, they might start selecting in those varieties. So they might have a, basically a farmer-selected variety over time in the grandchildren. Or perhaps if you're trying different conservation tillage, you will clearly want to look at what innovations, because most farmers I know are very good at welding and further adapting the conservation tillage equipment so it actually works for their farm and their site. So learning from that innovation, instead of just saying, OK, on farm, we're going to try and control it and set up the type of experiment that we're used to on experiment station. So this is just sort of graduated and systematically linked approaches so that you have areas that are farmer innovation, support that, areas where you have a subset of technologies being tested on many different sites. So this gets back to this idea of sampling environment, a wide range of environments, and then stacking information about that, perhaps through GPS type of approaches, and linking that to a replicated treatment. So don't worry, I'm going to get back to this, and I'm just going to further expand on this idea a little bit. So we have replicated, often researcher-managed mother trials, and these might be a long-term experiment. And it can be it's often it's difficult to establish a long-term experiment on a farmer's field. Obviously, they have other things they want to do with it than be part of the research forever. So a researcher-managed mother trial might be a long-term experiment where you could look at soil organic matter changes over time, for example, which takes a lot of time before you start to see and be able to detect differences in soil carbon. Then you systematically link this so that each of the daughter trials has a subset of technologies. This is a way to involve a lot more farmers. Because as I said, many farmers want to trial just a few varieties. or So in this case, they have uh, two varieties and a local check. I think it's really important to have a local check. A practice, which might vary from farm to farm, that you're comparing to the new innovation the option that you're bringing to the table. In this case, linked to a mother trial where you have all of the varieties and can look at them at once. Now, how do we analyze this? Well, one is to use a Latin square design when you first set up the experiment, very systematic way of making, in this case, farmers don't get to choose the subset that they're going to look at varieties, but they, which is another approach, more participatory, where each farmer chooses their own subset, and researchers can observe which ones they pick a lot of, and obviously that's a popular one. Another way to do it is systematically send out to each farmer a subset, say three varieties, and then tell them to compare it to their local check variety. And then with the, as a Latin square design, you can use that for a very uh, systematic approach for analyzing that. Now, what sort of on-farm monitoring we need to do at Michigan State University? Uh, there's an organic dry bean production system project where this is an example of the type of information that they gather. They have the farmer describe the treatments, 
course, the cooperator name. It's always important to get a physical description, if possible, to your reference information here. And I think it's also really a good practice to try and first have people describe what they want to learn from experiment and then what they learn from it, which sometimes is surprising. They might learn something totally different than they expected, like that this didn't work at all because we, you know, they had unexpected flooding or there might be some other learning that they didn't at all anticipate in the beginning. Another systematic way to support farmers and collaborators evaluating is to use what's sometimes called the Pepe, Pepsi versus Coke um, ranking. And that is most people find it really easy to compare two things at once. So you have your farmer tillage practice, the current practice that the producer uses, and then B, strip tillage in this case. Well, the farmer can think, OK, is B or A better? And then is C, which is ridge tillage, is that better than my current practice? So it's easy to fill this out, a little bit more challenging uh, to interpret, but there are ways to look at pairwise ranking, non-parametric methods. Here's from Purdue on farm research trials. So if you're looking at soil fertility, or in this case, varieties trialing, then again, you may want to get a lot of background information to try and understand the G by E, how the varieties are performing in different locations. Adaptability analysis by Peter Hildebrand and John Russell in 96, there's a nice little booklet on them, where you can basically look at the average yield, or perhaps some soil factors, edaphic factors like soil pH, as an environmental index. And I'll show you in a minute here. You can also look at calories produced. And let me give this one example from our Southern Africa work. So we had multiple sites, many mother baby trials, and put them all together here, and we used the average calories, instead of using average yield, because I often look at corn and different uh, cereal crops compared to legumes, again, like soybeans or pigeon pea in this case. So we were interested in how many calories, or you could look at protein as well, but in this case, calories of each of these technologies. And we knew that we had some high yield potential sites up here and some low yield, maybe very poor farmers, maybe a lot of weed management issues and low soil fertility. We didn't use just soil fertility because, as I said, there's weed management. Different management, different yield potential. But you can use the average at each of those sites, so the daughter trial or at the mother trial. What's the average overall? And that's an index. It tells you how productive that site is. And in this case, this improved technology, it had more legumes in it, produced more calories across all the sites. It's also possible it might have been a line like this. So in other words, it did well, particularly well, in low fertility sites and not so great, if it were straight across, not so great in the high yield. So that would say there's an interaction with the type of site it was. So adaptability analysis lets you look at G by E and whether they interact. In other words, does your technology perform the same across all sites or just in particular sites? It's a regression approach, so you could also use yield here, and then yield, average yield here. So yield of a particular variety or um, technology versus average yield at each site. And it often is very intuitive and easy to see whether te which technologies are performing better at which types of sites. So in terms of G by E, let's wrap up here. I think it's important to embrace, again, environmental variability. Use a large number of on-farm sites, or if you're doing this just on your farm, then multiple fields. So keep it simple so that you can assess more environment. Sometimes on-farm we tend to try and just look at a few sites because it's so difficult and complicated. So I'm just encouraging people to try and do some, some of, the, of your experimentation really simply, simple strips or simple daughter trials so that you can basically explore a lot wider range of variation. And in the end of the day, see how things perform under very different environments, which is one of the whole strengths of on-farm experimentation. And to make sure we pay attention to what, after all, are master integrators, farmers, and their assessment. And you'll always come up with really surprising, interesting insights if you engage that expertise by not just asking people at a field day, so did you like this technology? Well, people tend to say yes, so you're happy. Or some people are 
always like to point out a problem, but we should value that. Um, but most of all, to document that through some sort of quick survey or other, you know, some sort of focus group, somehow document what people are getting out of the technology. So, in summary, we develop the objectives and design depends, how your complexity of your design, for example, will depend on what were your objectives. How much attention you pay to education will depend on how important capacity building is as part of your objectives. I'm not saying all projects have to have capacity building, I'm just saying it depends on your objectives. Embrace the complexity and build in iterative learning opportunities. So times for reflection, which is so hard in our fast-paced life, but I think is really important. So ultimately, I'm coming back to this schematic in that we have different objectives for different parts of our on-farm research, and I think we should see more of all of these, not that one is better than the other. And finally, at the end, I want to provide a few uh, resources. And I want to say that SARE, ATRA, other uh, North Carolina, Wisconsin, all of them, I have found that they have really good, you know, really simple how to do an on-farm experiment. So that wasn't really my goal today. I was trying to show sort of bigger picture how we can engage and how we have to think about our objectives when we start an on-farm experiment. And so these types of resources, particularly this new systems research book, the Lord Drinkwater is publishing with Southern SARE um, that's just in press now. There's going to be really, there is, I've seen a preprint of it, the really detailed uh, approaches in terms of statistical approaches. So I really recommend that one. And uh, of course, this new participatory plant breeding toolkit uh, led by uh, Zeister from Organic Seed Alliance. So that's also going to be a useful tool, particularly if you're interested in participatory plant breeding. So I hope that there's some questions. And yeah, thank you very much. We do have some questions coming in. And for anyone who missed the beginning of the presentation, you can use the question box on your screen to type in questions. And just type them in and hit return. If you don't see the question box, you can click the small plus sign next to the word question, and that opens it up. Um, I wanted to let everyone know that this webinar has been recorded, and we are planning to post it um, to the link, which, is, which will be on your screen in a moment, um, and also along with the slides as a PDF handout. And um, if after the webinar you didn't get your question answered, um, SIG has generally has um, generously provided some resources here, um, including her contact information. And then we can we also welcome you to use the online Ask an Expert system at extension.org slash ask. We'll have the link for that in a moment if you have any other questions about organic farming. Um, you can find our upcoming webinars and recorded webinars at the link on your screen. And um, finally, before we get to the questions, I just wanted to say that we're going to be sending out a follow-up survey today, so we'd very much appreciate your feedback for that. So on to the questions. Um, here's one about um, the mother-daughter style trials. Um, we're doing mother-daughter style trials with mother on station and daughters on farms, but we don't have the resources or personnel to do ten daughters. Does it help to have daughters replicated on farm if we can only manage six, for example, on farm daughters? Okay, that is such a great question because it really gets at this issue of trade-offs. You know, sometimes people say they don't have the resources because, and I'm not saying this is this case, but sometimes because they're trying to do everything they do on the experiment station in the daughter trials. So every farm they're trying to get yield data, they're trying to measure soils, and uh, you know, depending on the objectives, a whole range of, you know, of monitoring. I would encourage thinking about doing a lot more daughter trials that just had farmer ranking of technologies. And you might learn some different things than really intensive measurements um, in the daughter trials. That said, I think if you have at least six, and I would recommend eight or ten because you're going to lose some along the way when there's some miscommunication about when the harvest occurs or whatever. So at least six reps if it's on farm. So uh, I encourage them to, to keep doing that, but think about maybe trying to expand a few more, and perhaps they could simplify a little bit 
the daughter trials, if that's possible. So good luck, and uh, great to hear you're doing that. OK, here's a question. Um, thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. I live in Oregon, and we have a growing number of farmers whose first language is not English. Some speak Spanish only. Have you done on-farm research on a farm run by Spanish-speaking farmers or workers? Well, you're lucky, because even these diagrams here today are from SIP, uh, which it has a whole range of resources for in Spanish language originally English they were translated into so um, I can send that um, I didn't put it up here because I didn't know there'd be anyone interested in that but there's some great resources for working with uh, particularly farmers um, in, the, in this case more from South America but I'm sure they'd be relevant so I'd be very happy to send those but just if you look at the CGIR.org and then SIP which is the center that works on potato tubers they produced a whole series, including a mother-daughter trial, amongst other things, a series of resources for participatory on-farm research, from plant breeding to uh, tillage to a whole range. So it's really a wonderful resource, and it's all free and online, in Spanish as well as English. OK. Um, can you discuss methods of teasing out the impact of many different practices in a complex, comprehensive farming system? Well, this has been one of my challenges when I, I mean, I've, this is something I've been trying to engage with, so I look forward to hearing from other people as well how they're coping with this. Because particularly in the U.S. where farms are large and complex compared to in the global south where they sometimes are quite small and so they maybe one field that has just one staple crop and then some garden area. But here we often have very complex operations and you know, farmers say, okay, I'm really interested in looking at cover crops, but then in the end of the day, the experiment they implement has to do with compost, for example. And so then you have each experiment, it's almost a case study for every single on-farm experiment. And that's what we found in our potato work that I mentioned Edgar Poe's um, work with the GPS. So one of our approaches has been to use GPS to try and characterize that complexity. So looking at a whole field as a experimental uh, platform and then assessing how soils properties vary over that field and then so using basically the farmers natural experiments and then giving the information back in terms of here's which of the properties of your soils that help predict your yield in that case um, or you could look at sustainability so basically embracing that complexity and not trying to impose the same experiment everywhere but looking at if farmers are trying to improve soil quality, for example, in that case, in potato fields, um, what seems to be, you know, using some sort of structural equation modeling, or what's your hypotheses about which types of properties will improve it, and not trying to worry so much about which way they improve the soil, but look at how it's the process is involved, whether it's more organic materials or combinations of organic and fertilizer, for example. So embracing that complexity, uh, trying to perhaps use a reference system. This is one of the approaches that my conservation tillage or zonal management group led by Nick Jordan from Minnesota. What we're doing is we're using, OK, if we can't find exactly ridge tillage on every on-farm site, but we can compare some sort of zonal management with a reference site. Might be a grass area, grassy area. So you compare soil quality as it's changed over time compared to a reference site. And some of the soil quality websites um, from USDA sort of describe this method a bit. So you might try and think of a reference that you can find at every site. Hope that helps. OK, thank you. Um, here's a comment from Sarah, um, from the communications director, that the um, Drinkwater Systems Research Book is in review at the moment. Yep. And um, the expected publication date is going to be the summer of 2012. So it will be available from SARE at SARE.org. So thanks very much for that comment. Um, OK, um, next question. Um, regarding using principal component analysis for diverse organic farms, how can you determine which factors are most relevant to quantify, um, like soil quality, cover cropping styles, irrigation, et cetera? Yeah, that is a really a challenge. And that's where I think the Drinkwater uh, book that's going to be coming out will help with that. Um, I would also refer to that Lori Drinkwater paper, because she and her group 
really took that on in 1995. And so other people have done that since, but I think it's one of the earliest ones. And in that case, they did control some things by planting the same variety into each field. And so if there's some things that are totally different, if you don't want to just take a case study approach, but you want to really compare things, you might manipulate by using the same variety in both systems. Um, your level of control is, diff is, is not very good, but you might be able to um, first think about your hypotheses, and then what has to be the same to be able to test the hypotheses, and what do you need to, to monitor in order to be able to, again, test that hypothesis. So I think really focusing on what your hypotheses are is really important. And then um, for principal component analysis, of course, you have to take a certain minimum number of properties. So you're probably going to be more heavy on the monitoring than in some other approaches. OK. Um, do you have advice for on-farm trials with animals? I think that participatory approaches is really important for livestock type systems because you can't do as much plot work or manipulations. Um, well, you can, but it's extremely expensive um, and challenging. So I think taking more of a systems approach and looking at paired situations or watershed, you know, more transects, um, taking more of a landscape scale and systems approach I think is really essential for livestock type approaches because well, depending on the size of, lens of your livestock, obviously guinea pigs will be quite different than um, horses. But um, you often need to take a much larger scale approach and, again, rely more on farmers to help design this in terms of what is relevant to their system. OK, um, here's a question about whether you found that this type of research is easier with organic farmers as opposed to conventional farmers. Um, the listener suggested that perhaps since the organic system is younger, that they might be more eager to participate. I can't say compare, because I've certainly found you know, farmers everywhere are interested in engaging in on-farm research. Farmers have been doing that forever and appreciate being acknowledged as experts and, and you know, collaborated with directly. But I will say that certainly in the participatory plant breeding work that I was just hearing about out of the Organic Seed Alliance meeting, you know, there's a lot of farmers, organic farmers are not getting the varieties they need anymore and so are very committed to engaging with breeders to develop new varieties that meet their needs. Um, what kind of compensation, monetary or otherwise, do you use to encourage the participation from your farmer trial participants? And if monetary, how much? <laughs> well, that would be really you know, specific. It depends on the project. Uh, clearly, some farmers are interested and see themselves as, as collaborators and perhaps they're retired and are interested in developing varieties with you and see that as the major outcome and, and um, may just need to be compensated for a little bit of ground that you're using in the trialing, right? Other farmers, maybe younger business people that are really at a time in their life when they need to have their time compensated as well. Um, usually, uh, I think Sarah has some recommendations to this, and OREI does, you know, maybe a couple hundred dollars for uh, a season of involvement. Um, depends how often farmers are involved in planning meetings and how much of their time that you're using. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, here's a, here's a uh, comment of um, someone who kind of goes by $25 an hour often. So okay. I'm sure this Thanks. can vary, um, but thank you for the comment. Um, you. Here's a question. Do you find that using alternatives to the random complete block design makes it harder to publish findings in traditional scientific journals? Well, this one I think we've seen a really a tipping point recently. Agronomy Journal as one that I'm an associate editor on, and we're really interested and even have sections now on systems. And I would say that in the past, it has been harder uh, to publish this type of work, not just because it's not randomized complete block design, although sometimes that's an issue, but because you know the outcomes might be, as I said, farmer capacity building, which is not something that you get in a journal, refereed journal, uh, acknowledgment for that. But I think if it's, you carefully design your objectives and are very clear on the, that you're doing a systems experiment, for example, you might have different types of checks. 
I mean, in my own work, I've had to art sometimes discuss back and forth with reviewers and try and point out uh, that I didn't always just have biological comparisons, like an intercrop experiment. I mean, I have every soil crop there because uh, I was looking at being relevant, in, in that case, to a Malawi agricultural system that always had intercrops, and so I would only have an intercrop check. So I think you have to explain your original reasoning, and I know as a reviewer, I also look for that a lot. Like, I want to know more than it was the extension recommendation you followed. I want to know, you know, why did you choose that type as your check system? And maybe you have, I would encourage people to think about, and this is something I didn't mention before, include more than one type of check if possible. So maybe you have a uniform control or check reference system that everyone implements, and then you have two new things they're trying, and then their own check. So that means half of the ground is in a check type system, but farmers have very good reference systems. They have things that work really well, so it's important to include that, and sometimes it's also important to include some sort of uniform control, and then your, your new things you're trying. So you may need to simplify what you're testing and uh, make sure it's a very clear differentiation from that and your check, so that in the end of the day, you still get some statistical inference, even though you've got the variability on farm. It's a work in progress. <laughs> but I think that there's more interest these days. Agricultural Ecosystems and Environment Journal, Agronomy Journal, um, even uh, experimental agriculture, agricultural systems. There's a number of journals out there that are really interested in this now, which is great. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in, so if you will just give, we have a few more minutes. So if anybody else has any other questions, um, I encourage you to take the opportunity, type them into your question box. Okay, here's one. Um, great presentation. Are you aware of the um, NGO group Adelante Mujeres in Forest Grove, Oregon? They have a branch called Adelante Agriculture that trains Latina women and their families on sustainable farming. So that was a comment. Thank you very much. Um, if anybody has any other questions, they can just type them in to the question box or other comments are certainly welcome. And um, I just wanted to remind everyone that this presentation was recorded. Um, you'll be able to find the recording within the coming week along with the slides as a PDF handout at the link on your screen. And um, you're also very welcome to attend our upcoming eOrganic webinars. We have quite a few coming up in February and March. Next week there's one on weed management by Eric Gallant of the University of Maine. So we'd like to welcome you to attend those as well and encourage others to come. Um, they're all free and open to the public and you have to register in advance. So, um, since we don't have any more questions, I'd like to thank you very much, Sieg, for this excellent presentation, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Alice, and all participants.